the dairy industry is a multi-billion dollar a year worldwide monopoly. They invest millions on clever marketing, deploying slogans like happy cows, happy milk, and milk does a body good. Great milk comes from happy cows. Happy cows come from California. We give our cows more time outside because happy, healthy cows make better milk. I know I should drink milk because it'll help me grow up big and strong. It's working! Keep drinking! They perpetuate consistent propaganda campaigns to humane wash and greenwash the industry to keep the average consumer under the spell. But is the actual reality of dairy consistent with what the industry tries to convey? Well, make your own mind up. Cows are complex, sensitive beings who display amazing traits of intelligence and a wide range of emotions. Dairy cows actively maintain friendships and have their own unique personalities. Each one of these animals is an individual having their own conscious, subjective experience of reality. So please keep in the forefront of your mind that cows are someone, not something. Although there are farms who use a bull in the pen for breeding, it is not as reliable as the most common form of breeding, which is euphemistically known as the AI method, artificial insemination. This process is essentially the sexual violation of male and female animals in order to produce calves to make up the dairy herd. Some farmers do it because it just does not make financial sense for them to go out and spend thousands of dollars. They just don't want the problems that some of the bulls cause. Some bulls are very hot, meaning tempered. They're very aggressive. If they can get more cows bred in like the first 21 days of the month, the cow cycle, they're gonna have more calves hit the ground, which actually brings better money. The advantage of AI is the selection of high quality sperm for breeding purposes. Semen quality is considered best when the bulls are under three years of age, prior to them reaching maturity. Sperm is extracted from stud bulls either via the use of an artificial vagina or more commonly via electro ejaculation with a rectal probe. As we load them into the alleyway, get them caught in the head catch. First thing we like to do is do a scrotal circumference measure. Uh, there are parameters set out for minimums on those young bulls and obviously they have to pass those. We also palpate the testicles, epididymis, make sure that everything palpates normally. And then we go ahead and do a rectal evaluation of the internal genitalia. So we can reach over the brim of the pelvis, palpate both internal inguinal rings, make sure that there's not more than a finger or two width in either one. This probe is uh, inserted into the rectum and it's got some very targeted weak electrical current that's targeted directly onto the accessory sex glands which I just palpated and some of the surrounding uh, musculature. That weak electrical stimulation then uh, causes him to have an erection and an ejaculation. And you will probably see the bull react to the first pulse. You can see the bull This probe is inserted into the anus there. of the restrained male animal where it sends in an electrical current forcing the bull to ejaculate. This is a highly intrusive procedure and highlights the perversity of dairy industry practices. Uh, you can see that he's reacting more so and he is putting out quite a lot of prostate fluid and there we had uh, an, a full ejaculate of uh, a good, what appears to be grossly a good uh, sperm sample. Once the semen is collected, it is distributed to dairy farms where it is used to impregnate the female animals. Of course, with cows being mammals, like humans they have to have given birth in order to produce milk. 
a method for females which generally does not legally require a licensed veterinarian involves restraining the cow in a cattle crush. Today we're going to go through a step-by-step -step process on how to AI. Point your fingertips to your thumb and insert your palpating hand into the rectum. Wipe the vulva of any manure in order to avoid bringing in infectious bacteria. Making a fist and applying downward pressure will cause the vulva to slightly open, allowing a clean entrance. Insert the catheter into the vulva at a slight upward angle to avoid the urethra. Begin to level out the angle of the catheter as you gently push the catheter forward into the tract. Now the problem with heifers is they have a very, very small cervix and they are, they've never had this process done before. So they can get a little jittery. Of course, they're uncomfortable. She's got, you know, a complete forearm upper rear end. Um, and then you're trying to poke this plunger in um, to try to find that without injuring her. She won't like it very much to begin with, but she'll get used to it. So you just kind of work your gun in there. Right there is the cervix. I'm against the cervix right now. Deposit the semen relatively slowly, about as long as it takes you to say one more AI calf. This is very common practice in most dairies, with 89% of dairy operations in the U.S. using this method. This procedure starts when a cow is at breeding age, which begins at around 18 months to 2 years old. These breeding practices are consistent in almost all worldwide dairy farms. Cows, like humans, have a 9 month pregnancy. Dairy cows are impregnated annually to ensure milk production remains consistent until they are worn out and productivity drops. In the dairy industry, cows generally have 3.6 lactation cycles with the average age at first calving being 33 months in the UK, with a 400 day interval between subsequent calvings. Dairy cows have been modified to produce up to 10 times more milk than they naturally would. Cows are milked at least twice a day and are hooked up to painful milking machines, which suck milk from the udder, along with any feces or pus present. So as you can see all of her legs, there's feces all over her. Feces all over her hooves. Feces all over her legs. Feces all under here. All under here, all feces. So, on the udder, there's also feces. And this is how you get feces in the milk because there's feces all over the animals. 30% of UK dairy cows have mastitis, a bacterial infection of the udder. Mastitis is inflammation of the udder tissue and it's most commonly caused by bacteria entering the udder through open teat ends. Once a quarter becomes infected, milk production, milk quality, and the welfare of the cow all suffer. But I think you're fine. That quarter there is really tight. And once we get the teat cell out, there's mastitis. That's the problem with her. The white blood cells are called somatic cells and you can measure these on an individual cow or herd level to get an idea of the presence and severity of mastitis. In the US, the FDA allows 750 million somatic pus cells in every litre of milk. In Europe, regulators allow 400 million somatic pus cells per litre. In Australia, there's no limit on how many somatic pus cells are allowed in milk. Dairy calves worldwide are almost always separated from their mothers shortly after birth. This is done so that calves cannot drink the milk meant for sale in order to maximise dairy industry profits. This cow here, over here, is standing over her calf because she knows, she knows what's coming. I think that she knows that they're going to take her baby.
This is her baby, belongs to her. We have no right to do this. Dairy cows can recognise their calves cool and vice versa from just a day after birth. Research shows longer cow-calf contact typically has positive longer-term effects on calves, promoting more normal social behaviour, reducing abnormal behaviour and sometimes reducing responses to stresses. The separation of mothers from calves causes an emotional pain similar to a physical one, and cows and their calves have been known to cry out for each other for days after the traumatic separation. Female calves are reared in individual pens, usually until six to eight weeks. However, it has been documented on UK farms that some calves have been kept in confinement for as long as six months, depriving them of much needed social contact. So these are the beautiful calves that have been taken from their mums. You can see that they've got these tiny hutches. We've checked their ear tags, they're about four months old, these calves, and in fact it's against the law to keep them in these hutches beyond eight weeks. So you just imagine, you know, what it must feel like to them to just be isolated from their mums right from the word go. And um, this is it, they can't exercise, you can see they can barely move. Um, they're kept, I don't know if you can see this, but it's um, pretty much deep in um, shit and mud here. Um, this is just no life for any animal. It's, um, they're getting to the point where they're finding it hard to turn around. Mortality and morbidity is common in calves. For example, more than half of calves on UK farms suffer from disease before weaning. And nearly all of these diseases are scours and respiratory disease. Female calves will go on to replace the dairy herd and face the same fate as their mothers before them. Dairy-bred male calves can be raised for their flesh, but are generally considered suboptimal compared to those bred specifically for meat. In the UK, 78% of male calves born into dairy herds are reared for their flesh, which still currently leaves around 60,000 slaughtered within 48 hours of birth, usually by gunshot to their head on the farm. According to The Guardian, in the UK this practice could be banned by the end of 2021 with sexed semen being favoured to ensure less unwanted male calves are born. Male calves who are not shot on farms will be raised for veal, either in the UK or Europe, meaning that the calves will have to endure distressing live exports for long distances to be slaughtered outside of the country, or alternatively, will be killed in UK slaughterhouses. In Australia, male calves in the dairy industry are either reared for their flesh or sent to a slaughterhouse at a young age to be used for veal or other processed meat products, or are also killed at birth. Calves in Australia can only be transported for slaughter if they are over five days old, fit and healthy, and the abattoir is within 12 hours. The alternative is killing them on the farm. The recommended methods of killing are a gunshot or captive bolt to the head. In the Australian Dairy Guidelines, blunt force trauma is accepted as a humane method of killing for calves who are less than 24 hours old. In the USA there are around 450,000 veal calves, the majority of whom come from the dairy industry. Shockingly, 15% of US veal calves are killed at under 3 weeks of age but most are fed a milk replacer and killed at a disturbing three months old. These are the infant victims of dairy. Around 10% of the beef herd are former male dairy calves, usually killed under 14 months of age. In Canada, typically young male calves are sent to an auction house to be sold to another farm known as a feedlot or grower. They'll spend about eight months at the feedlot before being sent to the slaughterhouse. This one here on the right, I got for 50 bucks because he probably, I don't know if you can tell, but 
He's a pretty small calf. Doesn't weigh very much at all. He might weigh 50 pounds. And the guy on the left, I got him for 100. Around 223,000 veal calves were slaughtered in Canadian federally inspected establishments in 2012. Almost all of them born to dairy cows. However, new animal welfare rules, which prevent calves being transported for more than 12 hours without food, water and rest, mean that many dairy farmers believe it will now be more economical to just kill male calves at birth. In the EU, there are around 6 million veal calves and there is a variation in male calf outcomes across the countries. But one thing is for sure, they will all be executed sooner or later. Now, don't think that by just not eating the flesh of infant cows that you are not supporting veal production, as this disturbing industry only exists because of your financial support of the dairy industry. Here we are on a farm in the UK here and I want to show you something that is a product of the dairy industry. Absolutely disgraceful. Come and have a look at this. So this is a bin. Uh, this is where you put rubbish and garbage. And I want to show you who's in here. Look at this. Look at this little angel here. This baby here, chucked in the bin like a piece of garbage, this beautiful angel. Thrown in the back here, that's probably, you know, sibling. Oh, absolutely fucking horrible. I'm in the UK right now. I'm in the UK right now. So, like, people say it doesn't happen here. This is exactly what happens in the dairy industry. In the UK, in Australia, all around the world. In the UK, calves under two months old can be castrated without anaesthetic. Now we're gonna go through the basics of castration, whether you're in beef or you're in dairy, castration happens on the farm. The age of castration is often discussed and the recommendation is as early as possible. The three main methods of castration include bloodless castration, using a device such as a Ritchie nipper or Bodizzo. These are used to crush the tube leading from the testicles to the penis and the surrounding vessels which leads to loss of blood supply to the testes. I don't just want to make sure that I've got it before I press. No, no, they're not coming off. Right, you're just so crushing it. Go crush. for it. Come on. 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 Come Another method is surgical castration. With the scalpel, I actually end up just cutting off the bottom of the, the scrotum, okay? With the Newberry knife, you end up cutting a slit down the, both sides of it. The scrotum is cut open to reveal the testes, which are then sliced off or torn out. Then I feel for each testicle and push it toward the cut end of the scrotum and grab it and pull it. It's important to tear the cord as I'm doing because cutting it results in a sharp, open cord and in the end you have more bleeding. And you want to pull straight back. 
so there's not a little pocket. Well, that, that's not the best cut. But barely got it. Let me try that again. You don't want to leave a little pocket. And finally, the rubber ring method. So I don't have any of the bands here today, but there's these little green rings that you put on here. They're elastic. And basically you stretch this out and then you pull the testicles through here and then you let go and that band will cut off circulation of those testicles and they eventually fall off. Got it? Yep. The industry can use a rubber ring or other devices which restrict blood flow to the scrotum without an aesthetic within Make the sure first week of right life. One, two, and it's pulled off, see? In Australia, according to the Dairy Welfare Standards and Guidelines, calves less than six months old can be castrated without pain relief. Let's see what's in the bag. <laughs> well, yeah. make a nice appetizer tonight. Disbudding, or dehorning, is the removal of the horns of dairy cattle by a heat cauterization. Yeah. Chemical cauterization, or removal of horns with various cutting tools. It is claimed by the industry to reduce the risk of injury to other cattle and workers and during transport to slaughter facilities is claimed to reduce the bruising of carcasses meant for sale. All methods of disbudding and dehorning are used in most countries worldwide and cause serious pain and distress, even when pain relief is used. In the UK, although it is required to use pain relief for certain methods of horn removal, calves can be disbudded via chemical cauterization without any anesthetic at all in their first week of life. Chemical cauterization involves the application of caustic paste to prevent the growth of horns. The use of chemical cautery poses a risk of serious tissue damage. It has been reported that calves have been blinded by cautery paste when they have been allowed out in the rain soon after its application. In Australia, according to Dairy Australia Welfare Standards and Guidelines, calves less than six months old can be dehorned without pain relief. Guidelines in the USA suggest disbudding or dehorning should be performed by eight weeks of age. Dehorning is considered a more painful procedure with a longer healing time. Calves are usually restrained for this procedure. In the EU, destruction of the horn producing area of calves four weeks of age is permitted by chemical or heat cauterization. No anaesthetic is required. In almost all cattle farms in the UK, cows are kept in housing for at least some of the year or are raised in intensive farms. Around 10% of dairy cows do not have access to pasture and many are denied access to the outdoors for their entire lives. In the USA, standard room at feeding troughs is 24 inches per cow, while cows naturally prefer to space themselves 12 feet apart. Recommendations for stool dimensions for a 1200 to 1500 pound lactating cow are 45 to 48 inches wide and 8 to 8.5 feet long, designed to prevent them turning around. Persistent lameness is an issue due to poor quality flooring and tracks and poorly designed cubicles. Over 50% of dairy cows suffer from crippling lameness and some cows are forced to wear chains called hobbles for months at a time to limit movement. There have been many exposés which show the callous and cruel treatment of dairy cows and their calves all across the world. These sentient, feeling creatures are treated as objects, used as milk slaves and seen as nothing more than money machines. They have been documented being beaten, abused and sexually interfered with, even outside the disturbing AI procedure.
In the US, the transport of cattle to slaughter is largely unregulated and stressful. Stricter rules on transport apply in other countries like the EU and Canada, but are still poor. For example, the EU only requires that cows are fed and watered once in a 24-hour period. In Canada, cows are transported extremely long distances to slaughter, most at around 280 kilometres. Dairy cows, who are no longer profitable, are sent to slaughter because of lower milk yield due to age, infertility or mastitis. The sale of their flesh helps to subsidise dairy farms. Many of these cows are too emaciated, inadequately muscled or have health problems, so most of their flesh goes to processed beef products like burgers. Dairy cows are generally sent to be slaughtered after around four to six years, but their natural lifespan is around 25 years. In the UK, 25% of dairy cows are killed annually, and around 50% of UK beef comes from the exhausted bodies of spent dairy cows. It's very clear that animals like cows, when faced with the prospect of slaughter, do not want to die and will desperately try to escape. Okay, so these are spent dairy cows in here, um, exploited mothers, and what happens is when they don't produce milk anymore, when they're not financially viable for the farmer, they send them all to get killed here. No matter what dairy farm it is, they send them all to get killed here. Um, when you go to a cow slaughterhouse, cattle slaughterhouse, a lot of the cow cattle that come in are, are spent dairy cows, so they've had their children taken off of them. Their whole lives suffered maternal trauma and this is what they have to look forward to a kill floor they're probably walking in there and they can s poor darlings they're probably walking in there can smell the blood can see body parts of their friends and A horrible place in there. The most common method for slaughter is via a captive bolt gun, which shoots a rod into the skull and destroys the brain. We place it on the surface, depress the handle. In this clip from Spain, a young beef steer pleads for his life. These peaceful, gentle beings beg their killers for mercy, but aren't shown any at all. Then the throat is slashed open to bleed them out. It is estimated that between five and 10% of cattle are not stunned effectively and will have to endure the terrifying experience of either being shot repeatedly in the head being hung up by the leg which often dislocates the hip bone under the animal's immense weight and then having their throat cut and blood drained whilst fully conscious Another shocking fact 
is that around 150,000 dairy cows are slaughtered while still pregnant in the UK each year. In the USA, around one third of dairy cows are removed from dairy herds each year, the majority of whom are culled. In Canada, a quarter of a million dairy cows are murdered annually. There have been countless documented horror stories in slaughter factories all across the world. These dairy cows have experienced the misery of being repeatedly raped to impregnate them, having their calves stolen from them each year, being mutilated, psychologically and physically abused on farms. And finally, after their bodies are completely worn out and the industry cannot take anything more from them, they will endure the frightening reality of a brutal death. Finally, the dairy industry will take one last thing from them, their life. The dairy industry relies heavily on false claims about the health properties of their product. Claims like, milk is good for your bones and you need dairy for calcium are completely unfounded and are really just clever marketing. These lies have infiltrated the education system, doctor's offices, and other institutions. Interestingly, the dairy industry fails to mention that dairy products are high in cholesterol and saturated fat, which contribute to heart disease, the number one killer of human beings. The fact remains, you can be completely healthy and get adequate protein, calcium, and complete nutrition from a whole foods plant-based diet, along with a simple B12 supplement. Some great plant sources of calcium and protein include Soy products such as tofu, soy milk, tempeh and natto, beans, peas and lentils, nuts, seeds and dark leafy green vegetables. It's very important to state that plant sources of protein are associated with better health outcomes overall compared to dairy sources of protein. In fact, this prospective cohort study, which included over 130,000 participants from the nurses health study, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that high animal protein intake, including from dairy specifically, was positively associated with cardiovascular mortality, yet high plant protein intake was inversely associated with all-cause and cardiovascular mortality. So in this study, the substitution of plant protein for animal protein, including dairy, was associated with lower mortality. But even if you don't trust the data, there's no case that dairy is better than plant-based diets for overall health. So based on the evidence we have, there's no justification to do what we do to animals for their milk or flesh. Another deeply troubling fact is the sheer amount of land needed to raise animals for their milk and the feeding of tons of food and precious water to dairy cows who have incredibly high energy demands is such an insane and inefficient use of the Earth's finite resources. In fact, a huge study conducted at Oxford University, which looked at almost 40,000 farms in 119 countries, showed that meat and dairy uses a staggering 83% of farmland and produces 60% of agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions, yet provides just 18% of calories and 37% of protein. The research showed that without meat and dairy consumption, Global farmland use could be reduced by more than 75% and still feed the world. Joseph Poor, who led the research, concluded from the study 
that a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth. Not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water use. So, here we are. You've come this far, but where do you go from here? Well, the next step is to boycott all industries that exploit and murder innocent animals. Brother, he, he, this is much better. Is, you know what, what you're doing is, like, you know, you're stopping the people to buy something. We want them to buy this. Why? Because this is better for the cows. Customers. Stop lining the pockets of animal abusers and instead try the many plant-based milks, yogurts, cheeses, vegan meats and egg alternatives. Support revolutionary initiatives like ReFarmed, whose mission is to convert animal farms into oat milk producers, thereby giving animal farmers another source of income, while at the same time combating the costly impact on the environment and the animals. And finally, take action. Help dispel the pervasive myths perpetuated by callous industries like dairy. These industries do not care about you, the earth, or the animals. They care about their bottom line, no matter what the true cost is. So please, share this message far and wide and help educate others so they too can make their own mind up. I think that we've become very disconnected from the natural world and many of us, what we're guilty of is an egocentric worldview. The belief that we're the center of the universe. We feel entitled to artificially inseminate a cow, and when she gives birth, we steal her baby. Yeah, that guy's a scumbag for doing that, but he's doing that because you want to eat what comes out of her body. Read yourself the superstition of human exceptionalism, of the myth of justified torture. Future generations will define you morally by which side of this issue you are on. We're making sure the next generation knows that every glass of milk, every slice of cheese, a scoop of ice cream, a spoonful of yogurt and dollop of cream is the product of sexual violation, mutilation, kidnap, misery and slaughter. This is how easy it almost always is to be vegan. You go to the supermarket, the one you always shop at, and you're about to get the cow's milk and then you go, oh, I'm vegan now, and then you just do this. And you just get different milk, soy rice, that's it. So easy, man.